I'm Mark Wolf from uh, SAS Institute. Thank you. Uh, thank you and, and good afternoon. And um, what a wonderful uh, prelude to my talk uh, uh, that the professor gave. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for being here. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to share some of the work that I and some of my colleagues are doing at SAS in the area of text analytics, uh, particularly focused on safety issues and regulatory issues, uh, but more broadly, uh, developing uh, similar techniques in understanding uh, best practices in collecting data from social media and uh, understanding uh, veracity, or more specifically, I would say, uh, and generally as well, signal-to-noise analysis of, of text uh, data on the web. So with that, uh, let me begin with uh, sort of um, my central dogma, both, uh, I think, practically and intellectually at work. Uh, I very much believe uh, this comment from, uh, as I like to say, the greatest analyst that never lived. Uh, the idea that we all accept a, a high degree of individuality uh, but at the same time, as we start to gather more and more data, uh, particularly the numbers of tweets that you were mentioning, there, there does arise a certain certainty in, in what we see in front of us. And, and this has served me well in, in some of the work that we've done. Our objective, quite frankly, was to address the great interest there is in understanding whether there's meaningful information broadly on the web and frankly, to distill the web down into a series of SAS tables. Well, I work at SAS, so I chose SAS tables, but they don't have to be SAS tables. And in doing so, uh, trying to come up with some sort of uh, structure that allowed a level of automation, uh, understanding the need for the human being uh, in the process, and to create as parsimonious and simple approach as possible, and at the same time from that work towards something more sophisticated. And what we ended up really working on is something that we call unsolicited, self-reported, symptom treatment outcome measures. That's a lot of words. What does that mean? I said something about something that nobody asked me a question about. <laughs> That's basically what that means. But having said that, there actually is a formality to it, and I'll get to that in a minute. But how did we even, at SAS, uh, how did we even get there? Well, if you want to do business with the US government, you go on this website, fedbizops.gov. And there, the US government provides solicitations for opportunities to work with them. This was a fascinating one, just, uh, I think, uh, 2012. The FDA was looking for vendors to provide techniques that would allow them to crawl the web, collect information from the web, and understand how the people for whom they work, at least on paper, um, what they think about the products that the FDA regulates, specifically drugs, devices, and to some extent food as well. Not only what they think in terms of their preference or, or, or uh, their opinions, but also could we extract possibly safety information. Ultimately, one of the jobs that the FDA has are monitoring the safety of drugs and devices and doing what's called signal detection or post-marketing pharmacovigilance. Signal detection effectively is at what point does a number of observed events over expected events exceed a threshold that would indicate to the regulators an emerging safety issue. Now you can imagine how difficult that problem is. We can understand the observed part but how in the world can you create a measure of confidence in an expected number of safety events for a drug across the whole globe? That is a challenge. So one of the opportunities that the FDA presented was, well, perhaps we can better understand the signal detection problem by looking at and, and comparing the frequency of certain concepts and terms being discussed in social media relative to drugs and devices vis-a-vis -vis what is inside of the federal databases that are formally collected for safety, as well as the scientific literature. Well, we and, and I and some of my colleagues submitted a proposal to the FDA for that solicitation, 
And I can tell you that we not only uh, worked on a proof of concept with them, but that was quite successful, and we ended up actually doing a project supporting the first ever approval of a medical device uh, where safety and efficacy were considered alongside of, quote unquote, the voice of the patient. What were patients thinking about these potential therapies and whether they were for or against them, whether they were willing to accept extra risk, and any number of other parameters. And I'll talk to that in a moment. But having said that, they also wanted to understand whether patients had a certain opinion. Imagine a regulator asking the question, here's a company, they want to make a pill. The pill seems to be safe, seems to be effective, and then they ask the question to the patients, do you actually want the pill? That has never happened before. That's actually quite incredible that the regulators would actually go out and consider and solicit uh, the patient's opinion. So in this case, this is what's called the patient preference initiative. So this was tied not only with the safety issues that we were able to uh, um, identify in the social media data, but also this preference component. So. Fundamentally, I mentioned these self-reported unsolicited symptom treatment outcome measures. Well, really, we can shorten that to a PROM. A PROM is something that both EMA and the FDA understand. A patient-reported outcome measure is effectively anything anyone says about their health that has not been in any way manipulated, translated, or uh, interpreted. So what that means is whatever anybody says about their health, that's a PROM, and it is accepted as a parameter which we can measure, uh, broadly speaking, whether it's safety, efficacy, or any other thing we're interested in in terms of how a drug affects uh, a, a patient. So really, in a sense, what we were saying is we're going to collect problems from the internet. Uh, the project that we began, uh, the FDA handed us uh, a medical device that was particularly interesting to them called the vagal nerve stimulator. Uh, it was on the market. It was controversial, potentially dangerous, and myself and a colleague decided to crawl the web, collect a lot of information, and the first thing we realized is how can we believe what we read? So we began then to think about methods to interpret or to process or to filter those data, uh, veracity scoring, but really in the end we came to think of it more as signal-to-noise attenuation. Uh, this first work we did was published and, and presented, so you can find that on the web. Uh, many people suggested where we should look for these data. Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, any number of places. Uh, obviously, for us, we did not want to go and look where there was a firewall. So places like Facebook, patients like me and others, we really didn't want to um, have to go through the firewall or to be an individual with a user account and then crawl inside and pull out data. We wanted fully public data uh, data where the people who posted by posting agreed that their information now is public and available to anyone. We tried Twitter, and when it comes to drugs, safety, medical devices, Twitter was a disaster, an absolute disaster. And in fact, uh, there are many studies in the U.S. that show Twitter actually to be a propaganda platform or a sales platform. Uh, this was a study done where a political debate in the U.S. was being monitored by a, a well-selected and controlled focus group in real time versus a real-time Twitter feed analysis. And what this study found was that Twitter was exactly the opposite of what the human beings in the room were saying. Basically, a group of individuals decided that they were going to scream very loudly on Twitter and make Twitter make you believe that Twitter is saying this person's doing better than that person, whereas reality was quite the opposite. So we abandoned Twitter, and I think we did the right thing because not too long after that, a paper was published in, in, a, in a very well respected uh, peer reviewed journal, and their conclusions after analyzing Twitter for drug safety signals was there's a lot of noise, and what there is, we don't even know if we can believe. So we felt pretty good that uh, bypassing Twitter and moving on to other sources of data was the right idea. Uh, excuse me, let me go back one. Where did we go? What we found in going around the web and thinking, where do people talk about their health? Where would they talk about their health in an honest and open and meaningful way? We found that patient-centric or disease-centric forums 
Uh, the vagal nerve stimulator is indicated for things like uh, depression, epilepsy, obesity. If you go to epilepsy.com, if you go to healthyplaces.com, these are places that forums and communities form. Tens of thousands, if not more, of individuals post back and forth questions, comments, answers, and what we were really surprised to find, quite honestly, were that these comments were incredibly useful, had a tremendous amount of information, but yet still there was some level of noise. And I'll address that in a moment, of how we took care of that. One of the challenges uh, to address this noise was to what effort, how much human versus machine effort do we go in? How many rules do we build? How, about, how much expert analysis and, and curation of those data will we need to put in? Do we have to define things like biological plausibility? I took aspirin and my arm fell off. Do we actually have to write a rule that says if you take a pill, your limbs should not fall off, for example? Or my head exploded, and on and on and on. Uh, we, we, we tried to understand the distributions and ranges of, of, of patterns of language and look for anomalous uh, um, uh, text. We tried to model certain subsets and cohorts that we identified and use those then to score new information. We built a variety of network uh, type approaches like social network uh, to understand how comments, how replies, how reposts and so on relate to each other. So we actually did a fair amount of work to, to sort of exhaust in our minds what we could and could not do and how much effort it would take. We did a lot of mathematical modeling. I was very fortunate to get a group of graduate students working at the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute in North Carolina. Uh, I handed them a lot of data that we had collected and I asked them naively, I said, build me purely mathematical models to separate and segregate, segregate these comments uh, based on what we would consider useful and not useful. And those students were remarkable. They developed all sorts of approaches and techniques. What you see here are things like helpful authors, unhelpful authors. And then they gave me those data. I read a sample of those documents and actually agreed with some of their analysis that you're right, if I were uh, somebody, as I am, interested in safety uh, of, of drugs in, in patient populations, I would find these useful and I would find these as noise. We use some of their insights to further develop some of these mathematical approaches to the signal to noise analysis. In the end, we also were concerned about sort of what I would call the Twitter effect. This idea that someone may amplify their voice by either posting very frequently and very often, or using different uh, um, usernames. Uh, th there's a common sort of belief that for many celebrities and many other people, there are a lot of fake Twitter accounts, that these accounts are simply pumping up uh, the perception that there's a lot of followers and so on. So what we did, here's an example comment uh, uh, that we would pull in and the metadata that we would find. You'd, you'd see that we have here the author, we have a date, we have a time, sometimes we have information about whether it was a reply, so on and so forth. What we would do is first take a purely mathematical approach and we would look, for example, how many posts any one author uh, posted given a period of time. We would then use certain keywords to identify the frequency of those keywords, whether there were certain words that were disproportionately being used. One of the most important things we found just count the number of words. The workshop we did yesterday, we used um, wine reviews. We had 5,000 wine reviews from the American Spectator Mag Wine Spectator magazine. And when we did a lot of modeling, mathematical modeling, to try to understand whether we could understand the high level of a wine score vis-a-vis -vis its price and its review in the magazine, the number one factor that helped predict whether a wine was of high or low quality in these reviews was the number of words in the review. And the more words, the better the wine. So next time you're in the wine shop, just look for the longest review and just go ahead and buy that wine. Now, we also understood behavior of cross-posting, uh, cross-posting across different websites. Um, and finally, 
Uh, we, we tried to address this issue of, of an author uh, having uh, many, many, many pseudonyms, let's say, and posting over and over to get some kind of, let's say this person really disliked the company that made the medical product and it wants to um, bad mouth, as we would say in English. It wants to give that company a bad name. So what we would do is we would create models uh, of the language patterns per author. So the author became the target, and then we built a mathematical model that describes how that author writes, and then we would remove all the authors from all the text we had and score all of the text again and try to find out whether our model would pick up our author and anybody else. Surprisingly, that doesn't really happen when it comes to reporting about your health. We could not find a single person or user uh, that we had suspected used multiple names or aliases to post something over and over. And finally, um, we started to, to, to hone in on this idea of posting frequency as an important uh, differentiator in terms of what is useful and not useful. So what did we learn after a lot of work? Well, we had a simple education and then we had a very complex education, if you will. The first thing we realized is that if you take the number of comments in the corpus that you have collected and you identify the frequency of any one person's posting, and that frequency as a function of the total at a threshold, 0 0.02, 0 0.025, there's, we actually came up with an algorithm, uh, a logarithmic algorithm that actually tells you where to set the threshold based on the n, that will get rid of most of the noise. High frequency posters don't have anything useful to say when it comes to drug safety and health. Now that's a very specific topic, I understand that. But if you're interested in knowing whether 100,000 comments related to heart disease, whether something is valuable or not, you can actually use this approach to filter out most of the junk. And the junk will be people trying to sell you drugs from a Canadian pharmacy. People will be trying to uh, um, promote any number of other things. Word count. The fewer the words, the less useful the information. Not because fewer words means less important content. Few words can carry great importance but rather that in the way patients work in a forum, how they communicate, people who only say a few things are not really saying anything meaningful, and almost nobody cross-posts. If they're cross-posting, they probably don't have anything interesting to say. Now, this is relevant to health and safety. Now, the more educate, sorry, the more formal knowledge and education is we came up with three very formal approaches that we're developing to sort of build this lie detector for the internet. Uh, the language is pretty dense here. Uh, experts better than I uh, helped me uh, develop this. But the first one are the mathematical approaches that we developed, codified in a more formal language and a more formal approach. The second one is a more linguistic and semantic approach. And the third one is something very interesting. Human beings communicating with each other on the internet often don't use highly clinical language or jargon. They will use very colloquial vernacular. Uh, they won't say that they have um, a, a, a migraine often. They'll say they have a headache, as an example. They won't say that it is, uh, that it is um, some highly technical clinical term. They'll use a common term for it. So one of the things we started developing is how to translate or interpret a comment that said, boy, my head hurts. Um, my eyes are kind of strained, I had to turn off the lights. Could we take that comment, score it, and come up with not headache, but with migraine? So the third part here is actually extrapolating from a comment information that may not be obvious. So we took all of that learning, we took all of that work. Uh, the FDA then came back to us and said, we have a, a device we're thinking of approving. Uh, we did the safety and efficacy work. We did a formal scientific uh, uh, survey in the literature. We would like you to go into social media and find out what people think about these issues, about obesity and how obesity can be treated, about epilepsy and how epilepsy can be treated. So not only general comments about the disease state, but rather specific comments about qualities and attributes of the disease state. And because the device had not yet been approved, we used surrogate devices that potentially were equal or comparable 
uh, to the device in question. Uh, as I said, the device was fully tested and evaluated uh, by the regulators, and the results of the survey were published. So we had a reference point about what the survey uh, uh, found out people's opinions were. What, are, what is their risk tolerance? Would they use it for obesity versus uh, epilepsy, so on and so forth? And these are the results and the work that we co-published with the FDA. And what you can see here is basically any number of comments were collected. They were parsed for specific attributes, and we applied the signal-to-noise uh, uh, approach we mentioned. And in this case, what we found was good enough was just the frequency filter. We found that as we adjusted a certain percentage of comments to delete based on frequency, no, I apologize, frequency and word count. Frequency and word count was sufficient. And we tested, I, I don't want to use the word validated, but we evaluated that filter based on manual curation of the document. So I actually read most of the stuff to find out whether the filter did well. Did it eliminate all the noise? No. But in these large numbers, we thought it was unnecessary, and it was sufficient uh, for this work to give both us and the FDA confidence that we actually could crawl the web, collect information from public forums, information related to health and safety, and then to report that meaningfully to the regulators. And so then I'll finish with the end of the quote uh, for uh, um, Sherlock. And then he basically goes on to pretend he's a statistician. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have any question? We have time for one question. Thanks, I enjoyed Hello. your talk. Very good. <clears throat> um, the question that I had is, um, someone who's read your poster and your paper, do you think that it's possible that they would <clears throat> learn how to plant fake comments to get the result that they want? Because uh, that's happened with other, with other things. Absolutely. Um, I will be so bold as to say no. And um, to some extent, uh, it's a little bit of the uh, sort of theory of large numbers, possibly. Uh, but some of the experts that I've worked in, experts in semantics and language, uh, and even culture and anthropology, th this actually comes into play here. I was in Japan speaking with their regulatory authorities, and they said, this will never, ever work in Japan. I said, why? I said, we would never, ever share that information as a people and as a culture. I said, well, that, that's, a, that's a temporal problem. Eventually, all of those people won't be alive anymore, and the only people left are the ones that are sharing everything on the internet. <laughs> but that's another problem. No, because um, one of the things that we've learned is it is understood that it is very, very hard to lie when you write. It's easy to lie when you talk. It's harder to write when you lie. And with enough numbers, we had incredible confidence that, for example, when we were looking at two comments, that they were by two different people, by two different authors. And if somebody were manipulating the ability to overcome that and making subtle changes in the structure of the language in order to say, OK, this is going to be different enough that, that a, a text analytics model using SVD and looking for all the patterns won't identify it, I would say, no, we'll, we will eventually identify it. And what we'll see then is, is either the consistency of the comments or the consistency of the changes in the comments, sort of like in liar detection, right? So I think it's going to be very, very hard to take a few hundred words and manipulate them in a way that you're saying the same thing. I hate this company. It killed, you know, it killed my dog. And you say it over and over and over in subtly different ways. No, I think it'll be very, very hard for anybody to game the system. Uh, I have a question here. Sebastian, pardon. Yeah, pardon. Um, you make me think about something related to uh, detection of uh, suspected fraud. You yes. know, we've got the Ben Ford the law for uh, figures. You know, the number of time a certain number should appear at the first rank as a way to detect fraud in taxis. 
Do you see that in the future we'll have the same with words? Absolutely. In fact, um, some of the support I, I received uh, for doing this work was from, we have a very sophisticated fraud team at SAS. They do money laundering analysis. They do insurance fraud. And money laundering perhaps is one of the most difficult, difficult problems because you're trying to stop a transaction that may be fraudulent. But if you stop it and it isn't, the consequence is, is quite important. And you have billions of transactions and you have human beings, minds, involved in perpetrating this fraud. So every time they get caught, they change their strategy. So it's, it's a remarkable analytic problem. And a lot of that involves things like um, complex pattern in liars. Uh, um, but, but, but what happens is there's a fundamental, and it addresses your question, I think. Eventually what happens is, is you pick up the pattern of the fraud. It, it simply becomes clear at some point. The question is how long and how much, what's the end to get there?